Now, how many came this morning needing a word from God? All right. <laughs> well, here it is. <clears throat> Stop running from your fears. Psalm 56, please, if you will. Father, thank you, Lord, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for strength. Thank you, God Almighty, that this is your church. This is your kingdom. Our only prayer is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Push back the powers of darkness. Give strength to your people. I ask your Holy Spirit to overshadow my own frailty. God, give me the ability to speak this and to feel the feelings of your heart, Lord, and to stand away and behind the cross that you alone might be seen. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, speak to your church. I thank you for it with all my heart today in your precious name. Stop running from your fears. Psalm 56. This is Psalm of David. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresses me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for there be many that fight against me, O Thou Most High. What time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. In God I will praise His word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words, and all their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps. They wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. For this I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Now, I'm very thankful when I read the scriptures to understand that men and women of God who went before you and I and did great exploits for the kingdom of God were not super people. They were ordinary men and women like you and I who found the strength of an extraordinary God. They had to battle fear just like you and I have to battle fear. Remember when God called Moses and he threw down the staff and it became a serpent, his immediate instinct was to flee from it. Adam and Eve battled fear when they lost the covering of God and they hid in the Garden of Eden. The disciples, after walking with Jesus for three years and hearing, of course, the purest word of God that anybody throughout all time had ever heard, they had the word coming absolutely and directly from the mouth of God himself in the form of his son. Yet after three years of being under the word in the Garden uh, of Gethsemane, they fled for fear. Even after Jesus was raised from the dead in John 21, it says they were locked away in an upper room, the people at that particular time, for fear of the Jews. And so fear is a constant companion. It's part of the fallen nature of all of humanity. Now, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 1 says this. Now, I'm only going to read the beginning of the verse, and I'll read the second part of it later on. The wicked flee when no man pursues them. The wicked flee when no one pursues them. And that, in, the, in this context, it means that which in, is within all of us that does not line up with truth. That's the definition of wickedness. That which we have embraced, that which we think we are, that which we are pursuing, that which we are thinking that does not line up with the Word of God and the plan of God for our lives causes us often to flee from that which we only perceive to be a defeat. Most of the time, it's just an illusion. I remember one time somebody said to me, don't tell me worrying doesn't do any good. None of the things I worry about ever happen. <laughs> it's an illusion. 
You're a Christian. It's an illusion that you're going to starve to death in the days ahead. It's an illusion if you're a follower of Jesus Christ that you'll have nowhere, no roof over your head. It's, it's an illusion. And its only basis is in fear. And if you and I begin to give in to fear, and we let fear, in a sense, transcend the word of God, where Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Now that's either true or that's not true. And at some point in your life and mine, we've got to settle this issue in our heart and come to the point, as David did, I have put my trust in God. I will not be afraid of what others and circumstances and situations can do unto me. I am not going to flee because God's word is a higher authority than any situation or circumstance or enemy that I will ever face. Now, fear is a great weapon of our spiritual enemy. Satan wins many battles without facing any actual opposition from us because of fear. People flee all the time. They, they flee the will of God. They, they flee from very verses of Scripture that they are afraid might lead into places of difficulty, personal difficulty. They, they flee from it. And so you'll see the enemy winning battles all the time because people give in to fear. The children of Israel, think about it for a moment, as they were, before they came out of Egypt, they, they saw the power of God. It was, there was such a tangible display of it. An 80-year-old man comes into town with his 83-year-old brother. He has a stick in his hand and a one-line sermon and commands the, the leader of the greatest known army in that part of the world at that time to release the entire heritage of God, all the children of Israel, a, a laughing stock. I, I do believe that Pharaoh didn't kill Moses and Aaron initially just because it was such a joke that these two old men standing there saying, I'm standing here in the stead of God, commanding you to release as it is uh, this, arm, this uh, people of God so that they may worship God. And the children of Israel had time to observe the power of God in frail vessels. They, they saw nature itself was at the command of God. They saw that God had life and death in the power of his hand as the angel of death passed over Egypt and took the lives of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, but spared the firstborn of those who had the blood of the lamb upon their doorposts. They saw this, they knew this. As they traveled in their initial journeys, they, they saw the power of God part the seas of impossibility and drown all of their enemies. They, they saw this. They knew this. They had time to observe and ponder the thoughts, the ways, and the power of God towards them, to meditate on these things until it formed their character. Remember when God called Joshua after Moses died? He said, I'm going to send you in and the people with you, and you're going to possess the land and no one's going to be able to stand against you all the days of your life. You're going to have success. And he told Joshua, meditate in this book and think on these things and let that all be that, that comes out of your mouth. Let that be what comes out of your mouth. And then he said, you will have good success. They had time to think about these things. They had time to meditate. They had time to ponder it. But sad to say that most dealt casually with their calling. They were a people called out of darkness, as Peter says, and into the marvelous light and life of God. They were called to be a testimony to the glory of God in the earth. They were called to be God's people, just as you and I are called to be the same in this generation. We're not called to be ordinary, my brother and my sister. We're called to be extraordinary. We're not called to be natural. We're called to walk in the supernatural. We're not called to be like other men without God are. We're not called to be walking around wringing our hands and worrying about the stock market and about the future. Our future is in the hands of God. Our future is in the hands of the one who created us. But they dealt casually with this calling and they, they fell away. And they fell to fear when they needed the courage to take the final steps. The final steps. Do you realize that most of us here today, you've not really arrived at what your life is all about yet? Do you, do you understand that most, most in this sanctuary are in training right now for something? You're being prepared. You're learning about God. You're, you're, you're finding out about the ways of God. You're, 
You're taking seriously the, the power of God that's revealed in the scriptures. You're looking at the history of God. You're, you're, you're meditating on the things of God. And it's all a preparatory work for what God is about to do through your life. And there is a time that you will come to, we all come to it, when you're going to have to take some steps, which the Bible calls faith. You're going to have to walk by faith. You're going to have to step out of the boat and there are going to be no visible rocks on the water for you to step on. You're going to have to do something that looks insane in the natural. I remember when the Lord called me to leave my secure employment, my retirement plan, my dental plan, and every other plan that came along with it, to leave it all behind, to everything, everything I'd accumulated and worked for, to leave it behind, to pastor a group of 17 or so people that were meeting in a hotel at the time. It was insane in the natural, except that God was leading me to do it. And I remember having to fight through the fears, fight through the worries. Of, what about my children? What about their education? What about their teeth? <laughs> teeth were always a big thing in my family. My mother had this thing about crooked teeth. It was just a, a thing that she had. And she passed it on to all of us in the family. And you, you look at these things and you have to fight these things and you have to fight through these things. And, and I remember I'm standing in the church and I'm preaching to the congregation, give your all, go with God. And this voice in the back is calling me a hypocrite the whole time because I'm, I'm really not willing to do it myself. And I remember looking out the window one day and it was winter time. And I, I looked into, as I'm, as I'm preaching about giving your all for the glory of God, and I look out the window and there's, there's four or five little brown sparrows. And they're pecking away at, in the driveway in the wintertime. I couldn't see at what. It looked like it was just snow. And as I was preaching, the Lord said to me, Are you not of more value than these sparrows? The Lord feeds them. Will he not feed you, O ye of little faith? Now, folks, uh, you know, I, I'd like to be able to stand here and say I was just a spiritual superman from day one. But I was just normal like you, like everybody else. You, 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 in a sense, weigh your options. On one hand, you've got, you know, retirement plan, dental plan, all this. On the other hand, you've got faith and the call of God. And you hope by the time that comes your way that you and I have learned enough to know that the better way is to go with God. D do what God says. Walk the way that God calls you to walk. <laughs> Daniel chapter 5 records the... And historically, that the Medo-Persian army entered the city of Babylon, the capital city of Babylon, without any resistance, as the king of Babylon sat trembling at a table. The scripture says his knees were knocking together. A hand had appeared and had written something on the wall. And he had been a man who played fast and loose with both the writing of God and the things in his hand that he knew were set apart for the glory of God. There were vessels in his hand, and these vessels all were a foreshadow of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It was all leading to it. Everything was a type of that. Now, these vessels had been captured from the temple in Jerusalem and brought into Babylon. Then one day, Belshazzar, it just gets in his head to take these vessels out, invite all his friends and all the leaders and drink wine in them. Now, I don't know why he did that. Was he trying to impress his friends by the fact that even God had to bow his knee to him? Was he, was he trying to show them perhaps that he had somewhat of a proximity to God or that God was honoring him? I really don't know what the reason was. But I do know that something was in his hand that was set apart for the glory of God and he was treating it very lightly. And there's a calling in your life, my brother, my sister. Whether or not you realize it today, there's a calling. I dare say Perhaps I don't know how many people ever fully realize this, that there's a calling on your life. Now, you may not preach to thousands, but your life is going to be a testimony of the glory of God. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I do know it's going to involve faith somewhere along the line. You have to step out in faith, whether it's just sharing who you are as a Christian in your environment or stepping out on the street corner to minister to some kids who look like they need help or opening your mouth and speaking about Jesus Christ, I do know that there's a calling. And if, if we treat the writing 
lightly. If we treat this calling lightly, the enemy can come in while our knees are knocking together one day and we find ourselves not even able to offer any resistance to the powers of darkness as they encroach what's supposed to have been a fortified city. Now, people run from the fullness of that which their lives could have been for many reasons. I've known a lot of people who've run from the calling of God. And there's a myriad of reasons. Some, some just don't want the calling of God. And it would be nice if they'd be honest about it. Others are afraid of the future and what it might hold. And they, they had an insecure past and they really don't want an in, what they see wrongly as an insecure future. And so they're very reluctant to take a step of faith. They finally get the job they've always wanted. And so they block out everything of God that may even suggest that that may only be temporary. And there might be something else for them in the future. Some have been wounded in the past and they're finally starting to get whole and healed. And the thought of going on to the battlefield and being wounded again is an overwhelming thought. And it's a fearful thought. And... They just simply don't go that way because of that fear. But I believe the chief reason why a godly person who wants the will of God for his life or her life may fall victim to fear is stated in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, where the Lord said to Joshua, Be not afraid, and neither be thou dismayed. Now, we're afraid when we look and see the enormity of the task ahead of us. The enormity. When the Lord called me into ministry, it was the enormity of it. The thought of standing before people and speaking. The thought of being given when I didn't know how that was, for others, when I didn't know how that was going to be possible. The the thought of everything that was ahead of me. It's an enormity. It causes fear in the heart. But the dismay comes in when we look at ourselves and we see the lack of, of inner resources in ourselves to succeed. That's why the Lord said to Joshua, don't be afraid of what you're going to see in the promised land and don't be dismayed because you, you have to face, for example, Jericho, a city with walls so thick that they say you could ride horses in a chariot on top of it. And yet here you are with sticks and spades and shovels coming into the promised land. How in the world are we ever going to overthrow a city like this? Don't be afraid at what faces you, and don't be dismayed at your own lack of resources because the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. It's never been your battle. In 1 Samuel 17, Israel was under attack by the Philistine army, and the Philistines had a giant named Goliath. And every morning he would come down into the valley and challenge the armies of Israel and say it, If you send a man out, send somebody out to fight with me. And if you beat me, we'll be your servants. And if I beat him, then you'll be our servants forever. There's got to be some courage. Is this not the camp of God after all? Aren't you not God's chosen people in the earth? Then if you are, it should be an easy thing. Just find somebody and send him out to fight with me. He said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man. I defy you. I stand a natural man. Just a voice as it is with no authority or power behind it except that which comes from natural ability. And he says, I defy, in a sense, the supernatural of God. But the problem is, in the days of Saul, they were not seeking God. This was a season and a time where armies were being fashioned around training and armor and spears and their muscles. I can just see all of the army sitting on the mountainside with this voice, this giant threatening them. And they're all looking at their biceps. They're looking at their spear. They're comparing it with the weaver's beam that Goliath was carrying. And they're looking. It's all in the natural. The whole battle has has shifted to the natural. And of course, when the church is found in the natural, we we will lose. We, We are not a match, in a sense, for that which the world has had seasons and time to formulate. And Saul and all Israel, it says, heard those words of the Philistine, they were afraid and greatly dismayed. They were afraid because they saw the size of the opposition. They were dismayed because there was not a single man in the army of Israel, not one, who had the courage or felt that he had the inner resources to stand up and fight this giant. Not Saul, not his captains, nobody. 
What a tragic situation. What a disgrace to the name of God. That moment must have been. Now, the, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing them. The wicked flee when that which is threatening them has no power. But the righteous, Proverbs 28, 1 says, are as bold as a lion. That which conforms to truth, that man, that woman who's reading this book and not taking lightly the call of God, there's a boldness that comes into the heart. There's a boldness that comes into the spirit. There's something that comes inside your nature that says, there's a cause here. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. He created this world. He died for it. He triumphed over the powers of darkness. It is of no glory to God to have me cower in front of my enemies or to have me running from interferes that have no basis in reality. There's a cause here. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, free from fear, free from these voices, free from these things that claim that they have the power to take your future and to destroy that which God has in your life. Psalm 56 verse 4, David says, In God will I praise his word, in God I put my trust, and I will not fear what flesh can do to me. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Proverbs 30, 30 says, A lion is the strongest among beasts and turns not away for anybody. Does not back off from any challenge. Designed by God that way. Hallelujah. Years ago, I saw a National Geographic video taken in Africa of uh, a lion that had killed a, an antelope. And a crocodile, an alligator, or whatever they are there, an alligator, quite a large one actually, had come out, had picked this thing up in its jaws and taken it out into the midst of this river where it was actually quite deep. And the antelope was floating and the alligator was chewing on it when the lion showed up. And the lion looked, and I remember the commentator saying, what, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? And the lion paced on the shores and then suddenly just lunged into the river lunged into the river and began to swim towards this. He was basically saying, you've taken something into your mouth that belongs to me and I intend to get it back. <laughs> and as he began to swim, this alligator has got this antelope in its mouth and as he sees the lion approaching him, even though his brain is no bigger than a peanut, he has enough sense to let that thing go and get out of the way. He swam the other way. The lion grabbed the carcass. Now, it's a full-grown antelope. He grabbed it in his mouth, and he began to swim, and he lifted it literally out of the water and began to swim with such incredible power back to shore, put it down on the shore, and turned and looked at the, Now, the, the alligator at this point is just two little beady eyes looking out of the water. And it's as if he was saying, don't ever do that again. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous are not content to see the devil devouring our young people in the streets. The righteous are not going to sit down and do nothing when the enemy is starting to roll over our homes and roll over our families and roll over our marriages and roll over our churches. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous finally realize that the living Christ is inside of this earthly temple. And Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. The one who lifts his head and backs not away from anyone. Has no need to back away from anyone. He's the absolute conqueror, the absolute victor. He is all strength, the sum of all knowledge and wisdom and power and majesty is all in his hand. And by God's grace, he lives inside of us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Goliath is coming out every morning and he's taunting the armies of Israel. Give me a man, he says, give me a man if anyone's left among you with any courage to fight against me. And if I beat you, you'll be our servants forever. And he was getting away with it as everyone sat on the hillside and they cowered and checked their armies and their armors. 
Until suddenly the young boy walks into the camp and the Lion of Judah walks in with him. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to God. And young David hears this. this. He had learned, he had found the strength of God. He had already had some personal battles as a young shepherd in the wilderness and he had seen the strength of God come upon him. And he had a courage inside of his heart. And he went and he fought those things and he won against them. And as he came into the camp of Israel and he saw this, this giant standing and mocking the armies of the living God. David said, what is what's going on here? Why is nobody fighting this guy? Why are we letting him get away with this? Is there not a cause? And then, of course, they got very annoyed with him. They accused him of pride. They accused him of leaving a few sheep in the wilderness, of coming down just to see the battle, which there was no battle going on because of fear. <laughs> and David said, don't let anybody's heart fail. I'll go and fight with this Philistine. The wicked flee when no one pursues them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Here's a young boy who had taken seriously the word of God. He'd taken seriously the calling of God. He'd taken seriously the touch of God that had come into his life. He was not playing games with the call of God. And he had a passion inside of him for the glory of God. And he knew that this was bringing no glory to God, this entire situation. He said, now I'll go and fight with him. The scripture tells us that he rejected the armor that was leaving people in fear. All of the men made armor, all the methodologies. He had no training whatsoever, but he had a heart that was ablaze with a passion for the glory of God. He was a shepherd. He took five smooth stones out of a brook. And I've always personally believed that that was a type of the fivefold ministry in the church of Jesus Christ. He put them in a bag because he was showing us today where the power of God is going to be found. Not in might, not in power, but it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in nothing of the flesh, nothing of natural strength. It's everything of God and only of God. And when everyone else is sitting on a mountainside filled with fear because of the day that has come upon them, this young boy goes down into the valley with what he knows and what he has proven. And there's got to be something in your life today that you know and you've proven. You know that you've been brought out of darkness. You've proven the fact that Jesus can set you free. You know you're not the person you used to be. You've proven because your mind doesn't think the way it used to think. You know that God's word is true. You've proven it little by little, line by line. But then there comes a moment in your life where you've got to respond to the call of God and go in and begin to fight the giants themselves. And David goes down with what he has proven, with what he has known. He goes down with a heart filled with confidence, willing to risk his life for the glory of God. I've always felt that it's better to die for the glory of God than to live a coward. Goes down into the valley. We're going into Haiti in June and again in November. We're going to believe that God Almighty is going to break that spiritual bondage over that nation once and for all. A nation in the mouth of the lion. A nation devoured. And folks, it would be presumption to go there without the anointing of God would be presumption without believing that Jesus is the God of the impossible. He is able to do what the whole world can't do with all its resources. And David goes down and immediately the Philistine giant begins to mock him. He looks upon him and he's just a youth and the scripture says he disdained him. Oh, is this what God is sending against me? This skinny little 14-year-old with fair hair, fair complexion and red hair. This little kid, am I just a dog? He said, you come to chase me with a stick? And David says, no, you come to me. He said, with armor, you come to me with a spear. But I come to you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. I come to you in the name of the God that you have defied. And this day, I'm taking your head from you. 
This day, he said, I'm going to cast you and I'm going to cast the whole Philistine army to the birds of the field. Your carcasses are going to be food on the ground for these powers of hell that are all around us. I'll smite you today, he says, and I'll take your head from you. And this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. That's why Paul says, you see your calling, brethren. Now, I guess the question this morning is, do you see your calling? Not many mighty, not many noble, not many of royal blood, but the foolish, the weak, and the despised. And things that are nothing, God has chosen. Chosen. Chosen for a defining moment, perhaps in history. Chosen for the season that we're living in in New York City. Chosen. Chosen to make a difference. Chosen to fight that which is raising its voice above everything that is in the Word of God. Chosen. Chosen. When this world thinks that it's rolled over the Christian church... There's always a voice that comes and says, roll back the stone. Roll back the stone one more time. God will always have a people in the earth. Not the mighty, not the noble, not the rich, not the influential. But nobodies and nothings of this world. People who are ordinary, who somehow have found a relationship with an extraordinary God. They've begun to read his word. They've begun to understand the ways of God. They've embraced the ways of God. And they've said in their heart, Lord, God Almighty, I'm not taking casually this cup onto my lips. I'm not dealing casually with the writing of God. I'm going to go and I'm going to do what you've assigned for my life. And oh God, when that moment of faith comes, don't let me cave into fear. That's where we began today with David. He'd already been anointed. He'd already defeated Goliath. He'd already been known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. He'd already been in Saul's court. But now he finds himself surrounded by enemies. Voices telling him, you're not going to rule and reign. You're not going to be what God said you were going to be. Voices taking this future that God promised him into the very jaws of hell. But my Bible tells me that the righteous are as bold as a lion. There's a time that you face that devil himself and say, you got something in your mouth that belongs to me. And I'm coming to get it. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You think of it for a moment. The the alligator actually was the one with the upper hand, realistically. He was in his element. He's in the water. He could have grabbed the leg of that lion, I don't know, and done his rolling thing, whatever they do. (laughs) But there's something in the eyes of that lion that when his peanut brain saw it through his eyes, (laughs) he said, I'm out of here. (laughs) There's something about a believer in Jesus Christ When we lay hold of faith, when somebody somewhere at some time says, I have a future, I have something that God's assigned me to do, and I'm not letting the devil put it in his mouth any longer. I'm not letting him take it away from where I think it's out of reach. I'm going after it, and by the grace of God, I'm going to get it. By God's grace, I'm going to bring it back to the shore. By God's grace, I'm going to be nurtured by it. It's going to give me strength for the future. By the grace of Almighty God. Hell is not the one who has the authority to pronounce my future. My future is in the word of God, in the promises of God, in the purpose of God for my life. And I'm not going to turn back because of fear. Verse 9, David says in Psalm 56, When I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. When I cry unto thee, when I call out to God, when there's faith in my heart again. For this I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. 
Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. Thy vows, in other words, you've called me for something. You have, you've spoken into my life and I have agreed with what you've spoken. Therefore, O God, I'm going to go forward. I'm not going to be afraid. And I am going to praise you along the journey. And I'm going to give a shout of glory when this thing is all over. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God when I finally cross the finish line. (laughs) To know that I made it. I've just taken a bit of a vacation for a few days. And I had my son-in-law, Ben, with me and my grandson. And when we were driving back, it was a 17-hour drive. We stopped halfway in Maine. And the whole way there and the whole way back, this little boy never cried. I mean, it was incredible. I got close. But we would turn around and say, we're almost there. We're almost there. You can do it. He's only 18 or 19 months old now. And when we got to, to Maine, his daddy opened the back door of the car. And he, he put his hands in the air and he said, I did it. <laughs> I did it. Hallelujah. That's going to be my testimony one day. When God opens the door to glory and I raise my hand and say, I did it. By the grace of God, by the power of God, I did it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. The devil said you can't, but God says you can. The devil says you won't, but God says you will. Devil says only this far. God says there's no limit to what I can do through a surrendered life. (laughs) Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. (laughs) Hallelujah. That's going to be your testimony. When our time is done in New York City and we gather together, if there's reunions allowed in heaven... And the Lord will just give us that moment together to say, we didn't give up. We didn't quit. We weren't afraid of the future. No matter what voices were raised against us, we individually and collectively went forward. We believed God to see revival in our city. And by God's grace within us, it happened. We did it by God's grace and God's grace alone. My question to you this morning is simply this, what is making you afraid? What is it that is stopping you? Now, David had a choice. This was a very serious, difficult time in his life. And had he succumbed to the fear, now he did run, but not very far. God was able to get a hold of his heart again and bring him back, and ultimately he was crowned king. But it was right near the point where he was about to win this victory that the enemy came against him with the full force of fear, the full fury of it, the whole elusive venue as it is of what's going to happen. And he made a choice. He made a wise choice. He said, I have your word, God, and I'm going to trust it. I'm not going to be afraid of what anyone or anything can do to me. I have your word. And he cast himself upon the mercy of God one more time, just as he had done years ago when he ran into the valley to face the giant. And he found that the God of that day was still the same God of the day he found himself in. You must not run from fear any longer. Face your fears. Face them. If you run, it becomes a life pattern. You'll run all your life. Face your fear. Whatever that fear is that's immediately before you, even as I'm speaking right now, face that fear and don't run from it any longer. And that's where you're going to really, truly begin to know the power of God. That's where faith is going to come into your heart, where you begin to, where you finally see it was just all a veil. It was just a mist. It was just an illusion. This thing had no power over my life whatsoever. I'm in the hands of God. I want to give an altar call this morning for those who need to press through a particular fear in your life. And as you get up and make your way to this altar in a moment, we're going to pray together and we're going to believe God for the victory. 
If we could stand, please, in the main sanctuary, you could slip out and make your way to the front here in the annex. If you could just stand between the screens, if you will. The same in Roxbury. And we're going to pray together. Just as we worship for a few moments, just make your way down, please. Takes courage to face your fear. Hallelujah. But if you face it today, no matter what happens in the coming days, it'll have no authority over you. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Maybe we should sing that with Jesus. I can take it. <laughs> my future promise of my life that the devil has tried to take into his mouth and tell me that it's never going to be mine. With Jesus, I can take it. With Jesus, I can take it. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to pray a simple prayer for you because the Bible says in the book of Daniel, in the last days, knowledge shall increase. Amazing, isn't it? How countries are in upheaval now because of the information revolution. And, but it says, those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That means do things that can't be done apart from God. Those who know their God. Those who are spending time saying, Lord, let this be planted inside of my heart and my mind. Let it guide me. Let it be the truth that I live by. Not what I see and what I hear, but this book. Let it be my truth. Those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. I don't know what those exploits are, but it's an exciting way to live. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus Christ, Father, we stand before your throne today as your people. And we acknowledge, Lord, that it brings no glory to you to have us running from fear. And so this day we make the choice not to run. This day we turn and face our enemies. We face those things that are trying to devour the life of Christ within us. We stand against it in the strength of our God. And Satan, we rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God says we will be strong and do exploits, and so that's the truth. And Father, I pray for the strength of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Take us out of the parameters of human weakness and bring us in to that which was bought for us on Calvary, the full inheritance of our Christ. God Almighty, glorify your name through your church in New York City and in Roxbury and around the world, Lord. Glorify your name, Jesus. Glorify your name, O oh God, in this last day church. Thank you, Lord, that your word tells us that you take the despised and the weak and the foolish and the nobodies and the nothings. And you take us, oh God, and through us your life is manifested. Darkness is driven away. The glory of the Lord is revealed. Oh my God, give us the grace to believe this and to receive it. And to walk in it, oh God. Oh Jesus, Jesus, open the door before us. And we will go into the promised land. And we will fight for what is rightfully ours. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, God. We praise you. We bless you, Lord. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I can hardly wait to see what the Lord is going to do. Glory, glory, glory to God. 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 Glory to God.